What is up, nerd friends? Welcome back to the Nerd Bench. Thanks for tuning in as always. This week, we are going to do a setup and install on a brand new XR10 Pro G2S. Going to do a firmware update, install some plugs, and add on an extra power capacitor. Maybe we're not going to do those items in that order. I think first we'll put the power capacitor on, then we'll put the power plugs on, then we'll do the update. But uh, as you open the box, you hear the angels call, ah, right? No, you don't hear that? I do. This guy's popped into this little case here, slides out. Then I like to bring the plastic out, bring all the wires up, oh, like that. You got inside your best friend in the whole wide world, the instruction manual. It's got all the good stuff. There's a setting chart in here. If you need to know what your default settings are, they're all listed. A lot of folks think that you need to program a speed control to be able to use it. You just have to calibrate it. So this, this helps break all that down if you need to. And then a sweet folded sheet of stickers, which the, the crease comes out. All right, so there you have it. Your shiny new XR10 Pro G2S with the sweet fa frameless fan design. The cage here is actually part of the speed control casing now and the fan is inside and has no frame super awesome external switch which is not included but if you do need to get access to a switch that you know you can't reach the speed control to turn it on there are optional plug-in switches that you can get for that this comes just as you see it out of the box i'm going to replace the standard power capacitor which is fine for most of the applications that this is going to be used for but we run these with the sct motors in our 4x4 short courses and a little bit extra power cap never hurt i'm going to be installing the module e power capacitor that's the part number this is the one that comes as a quad cap that's in the black shrink wrap these are standard power capacitors, not the non-polarity ones. So while the speed control has reverse voltage protection built in, the power capacitors do not. So if I were to plug this in backwards, this cap pack would get smoked, or this one would get smoked, but the speed control would be okay. So you just put a new cap pack on there. Why am I not running the non-polarity caps? These are a little bit better overall performance for the applications that I'm doing these in. Four pole motors are very hard on the speed control and the plugs I'm using don't really give us an option to plug them in backwards, so I'm not too worried about that. So a little extra power cap goes a long way. A power capacitor helps the speed control stay alive. When it's doing all of its switching, there is a ripple current that happens and the power capacitors catch the ripple current and let it be used efficiently without damaging anything. Normally that ripple current would turn into heat in the MOSFETs of the speed control and that would lead to wear and tear and damage. Basically the speed controls kill themselves over time if they don't have enough power capacitor on there. So a lot of times folks will plug a speed control in backwards, it pops the power cap, they take it off and then they run it some more and then it fails. You, you can test the speed control without the power capacitor on there just for basic function, but you definitely don't want to run it under any load or push it very hard. So now we've got that, that all out of the way. First thing we're going to, oh, for, I forgot to turn the soldering iron. Now I've done soldering videos over the years and I like to touch on a few things each and every time. When you do work with wires, you want to have a decent pair of wire cutters and strippers so that when you go to trim wires, you're not getting frayed little leads that go all over the place. Typically, if you don't have a decent set of strippers, you use some scissors or whatever, and you'll cut the little strands. And when you go to tin everything, you get strands of wire in your stuff, and that's no good. When you are going to do power plugs, make sure that your plug surfaces are bigger than your wire. Otherwise, it's going to act like a resistor. I keep running into folks that are still using kind of undersized plugs for their applications. They're running big power setups, and they're using either standard TRX plugs, some of them are using Dean's plugs, or they have adapters involved. That's also a very bad deal. So just make sure that you you solder on a plug that's big enough to do the job like i said larger than the wire that is being used in the system a lot of times you're going to find lead free solder out there if you do you want to make sure that you get a little bit of flux either flux paste or liquid flux and familiar familiarize yourself with how to use that stuff i'm fortunate that i can still find uh, rosin core lead solder which i you know obviously a lot of the folks that are out there it's not great for the earth there's a reason that the whole globe uses lead free solder now but for hand soldering my toy trucks and making my rc cars work correctly this stuff works fine and you know i don't think i've ever thrown away any of my electronics and then i like to have a wood block and something to grip my plug with so that it doesn't flop around most of the time like a pair of vice grips works great you can just clamp these on there and it holds it still the hot topics on the soldering iron itself size matters when it comes to soldering if you're going to use solder big wire you want to have a, a decent sized tip this guy if, as you can see here this is 12 gauge wire and the tip is you know larger than the wire is as far as width so you, you need to have um, a substantial 
iron if you're going to do big wire soldering sometimes you get away with the little wire or little iron but not always and then you want it to be probably 850 degrees fahrenheit for the most part as a as a starting point sometimes i crank it up a little higher than that depending on what we're getting into this this is the the factory solder is that lead free solder that's real hard to get going and if you go to unsolder this and you're not having success you're going to want to get a little bit of flux or tin your iron with whatever solder you have it'll help kind of reflow everything but we'll get into that a little bit later for now we're going to do the power leads on this i like to do the power leads first because it's easy to mix up a motor wire and a power wire because they're all black up on this end so i try to do my power wires first get that out of the way so i don't have to worry about mixing that up later on and then i can do the updates and all that to the speed control as well for i'm putting this into a four by four short course that i've done a few of these for so i do the wires about half length and that's still plenty of wire trim those guys off It's not very even. I don't like that. Oh God. oh, God. That's terrible. Now I got wire shards everywhere. That's why you have a little work towel. So I can pick this up and move it away. But that's an example of terrible wire processing. Why you want to try to get your lengths right in one so you're not doing stuff like that. So when I strip the insulation off, I like to give these guys a nice twist to get the wire bundle nice and tight. And then I actually messed that up a little bit, so I hit that again. And then when I tin the wires, I try to have them lay sideways so the solder doesn't wick into the wire. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I know it's pronounced solder in other parts of the world, but here I say it, solder. I don't know why. That's how I grew up. It's also pronounced aluminum, not aluminium, in case you're one of those folks. So just saying. And uh, when I tin the wires, like I said, so they lay flat, so the wire doesn't soak up the solder because solder is kind of a bad conductor it's more to hold the wires in place than it is to make the contact and you want to get a decent amount of solder all the way around so that all the wires are covered and it kind of penetrates a little bit and that way you got some fresh solder to work with now this is an xt90 plug these are made by a company called amass and there's a lot of fake ones that are out there the real ones say amass right on there i love these plugs they're much better than stuff that i've worked with over the years and i continue to recommend them highly to everyone that i can uh this is the positive side i'm gonna lay this guy in there and you can see the plug is huge like it's way bigger than it needs to be but we run these pretty hard in four by four short courses and we get the battery packs and or we get the packs nice and hot so if you're getting your your lipos hot and you're getting wires hot and stuff like that you want to have a, a big plug otherwise the plugs start to melt themselves together and that's a real bad time triple checking that i'm getting the positive wire because it's the red one the case is marked all that I'm going to lay this guy on his side, let the solder flow, a little downward pressure on the wire, push it in just a bit, and that's all there. Oh, I forgot the insulator. Stupid. Every time. These guys have a nice insulator that clicks onto the wire to make them easy to work with. So now, quadruple checking that I still have the positive wire, we're going to put this guy back in there. And like I said, you want to have a little bit of downward pressure on the wire because you don't want your wire floating around in the solder. If you get a little solder bubble in there and the wire doesn't sit down onto the connector, you're actually doing yourself a disservice in power delivery and creating some more resistance. So I tin these guys a little bit just to help everything flow and meet together. As much as I say solder is a bad connector, I use it a lot, I know. But getting the wire through all of that is the key. And then think of your solder like the glue that holds it all in place. And easy peasy. Give those a visual inspection. Make sure you didn't have any loose strands or maybe it's just sitting up too much like this one. I'm going to give it a little touch up. Get this guy all the way down in there. Yeah, that's better. 
and slide this guy on. Now it's ready for almost action. Next, we're gonna remove the standard power capacitor and install the optional power cap. So this, you'll see, is a little tricky. And like I said, this is one of those times when I might turn my iron up a little bit more, but I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of regular solder and then just try to apply that temp or apply that directly. I've gotta put it on an angle so I can get some pull. And then you can feel the iron sink in and you just pull the wire up and out, simple as that he says with a smile. And this is, again, fresh tin. Apply a little bit of pressure. Once you feel the iron kind of sink in, you can pull the wire right out. If you do it quick like that, you don't have to worry about wires moving and you can get your next one set up just the same. So I do leave these wires full length because of where we mount them. I could shorten it up just a little bit, but I like to have a little bit of extra wire on these for the way we get them mounted in the truck, just in case something goes wrong and they start dancing around in there. So this lower side, positives here, negatives here. And I take these wires, I hit these with a little fresh tin, and then hopefully it's a quick one and done to get those guys into those same spots. So we'll do the positive first. And then put the wire right on top. You kind of kind of hold pressure on it with your, with your fingernail right there. I'm trying to put this on an angle. I don't know why, so I can see it better. And then the iron is just gonna go right in there, push down. It sinks through, you let go, and you're done. Obviously, you have to have a hot iron for that. And I've done this a few times, so it helps. Practice goes a long way. I did not, did I tin this? I'm gonna tin the black wire just to make sure. The fresh tin right before you go in helps everything flow right away. And a little bit of this um, rosin core leaded solder gets mixed in there and helps everything move a little bit too. That one wasn't as good, but still pretty good. We're gonna hit it one more time with a little more pressure. And that's that, ooh, that's hot. All right, so those guys look like they are in there pretty solid. The black one's not as good as the red one. See, it's a little bit lower, but it's still on there. Well, let's see if we can butter that up a little bit. I think I gotta slide it up. All right, that's pretty good. So a new power cap on there, and I do the wire twist because I'm a wire twister. It helps them not get snagged on stuff, makes it a little bit easier to mount. And then when I get these installed, the way they sit in the truck, they go like this, and we usually just uh, double side tape the power capacitor to the speed control itself, and then you mount this whole guy to the chassis to give yourself a little more surface area. You can get tricky, put it sideways, do stuff like that, but that's gonna be, it's most likely orientation when you get it into the truck. After that, we're gonna do a power up check, do the firmware update, and then we can talk about all the settings as well, because everybody loves to talk about stuff. All right, so we got plugs installed, we got our OTA handy, and we're gonna get this all hooked up and going. The app that you need is called the HW Link V2. Plug the speed control into a battery pack, you leave it. If you haven't calibrated it yet to a radio, just leave it unplugged from your receiver. If there's any signal from the receiver from like failsafe or whatever, it'll block out the program or make it not work. So if you have problems with this, just unplug it from the receiver. The little rubber plug that goes in your programming port, it is marked on the edge, but the easy way is the little brass guys go away from the case. I always remember that the little brass guys go to the outside. That guy plugs in there. OTA plugged in correctly. App open, you turn on the speed control, light comes on, you tap this little icon in the upper corner, you get this screen, and mine's called Charlie OTA because I've used this one before. You select it from the little menu there, and then you are connected. Now, before I do anything, I like to check a brand new speed control for firmware updates. So I go in here, and I see that the speed control is on five or dash the ends in an 03 and there's a new one for uh ends in an 05 so of course i want to update that very safe because it's not plugged into anything at all so this is the safest way to do the update and it says make sure that it's not going to do anything don't turn it all that stuff so you hit okay or confirm and away it goes now on the previous models of the speed controls this would take a very long time, many, many minutes. Now it's much faster. The new protocols in the GTS and the OTA are much quicker than they used to be, but we're gonna let this happen and I'll come back in a minute.
And that is that. That takes just a couple minutes where it used to take several. It says it's successful. You hit OK, and then it restarts. So you're disconnected now. So you need to relink, and it'll ask you where you are. It's that one, and we're going to connect. Now, for most of the group of guys that we run XR10s with, we all kind of run these same settings. So I'm going to go through, set the speed control up so it's ready for an install. And this is kind of what I always change in most of my builds. Um, You know what, I'm gonna unplug the fan so we don't have to listen to that the whole time. All right, so the uh, profiles are in fact named. You can select from all the different profiles here. And a lot of folks think that these are, you have to use these profiles if you run that class. And these are just presets so that it gets you kind of halfway to the tunes that you might want to try. They're not necessarily stuck on any of those. And you can change the names of all of them. Um, another thing that we've been getting a lot of questions now is why is the red light on the speed control blinking when it works normally? That's for the timings turned off. The blinky class racing is what that's all about. So just pro tip. Um, so now out of the settings. Running mode is the first thing I changed. We all need reverse where we go run at because we don't have track marshals and we're not officially racing. So if you need to have reverse, you need to go in here and turn it on all of the xe runs default with the reverse turned off max reverse force is set to 25 percent. i turn this up a little bit only because we get stuck in some hills and ruts and you need a little more back power backup power Jeez, that was terrible uh, voltage cutoff i always leave at auto because it's pretty safe you can turn it up or down if you want more or less runtime out of your battery, but auto seems to work really well. Uh, motor and speed control thermal protection, I leave both of those at default on the lower or safer setting. You can change the BEC voltage. You see here you have many BEC voltages to select from. Um, none of my stuff has HV servos, so I just leave it right at 6 volts the whole time to be nice and consistent. The remote off. You can make the speed control be able to be turned off by holding the brakes. Um, I leave that disabled. There is a sensor mode for full sensor. If you know you have a hobby wing motor that's got nice clean sensors, you can run that. If you've got a questionable motor or a sensorless motor, you can run it in the hybrid mode. Obviously, you're going to leave that full sensored. Motor rotation. If when you give your vehicle throttle, the wheels run backwards, this is the place to fix that. In a censored speed control, you cannot just switch the wires to correct that, and you don't want to run the reverse as the forward because then you don't get brakes and all that stuff acts really weird. So motor rotation allows you to make the motor spin the opposite direction when you give it throttle. Phase AC swap. Now, this is regards to the wires on the motor. A lot of the vehicles, the motor sits one way and the wires have to get back to the motor and they can either go straight across or like they'll have to twist and people don't like that. So this allows you to switch the designation of the speed controls A and C so that you can get the motor wired very cool. You definitely want to make sure that you got that wired correctly before you enable this because it will smoke the speed control on first try if you do that wrong. Uh, now we get into the tuning stuff. Throttle rate control is how quickly the throttle applies in regards to how, or how quickly the speed control applies the throttle to your input. So if you're real twitchy on your throttle and that's doing bad things, you can lower this setting because it'll slow that down. The lower these are, the slower the throttle will respond from the speed control. Um, at its max setting, it's linear, and that's where I like it. Uh, this throttle curves, you can adjust throttle curves, and in here you can actually customize it. There's If you need to get custom throttle charts, you can do all that in there. I'm not a Fan of that i like linear throttle so i leave that alone as well same with my throttle weight control i leave that turned all the way up neutral range is the dead band of the speed controls throttle the amount of space between the brake and the throttle so if your drag brake is real inconsistent or maybe your reverse is not working all the time you'll increase the neutral range because the trigger on your radio might be wearing out and it might be not hitting that same neutral every time um Initial throttle force is the starting power of the motor. So if you needed to like burst the tires a little harder off a of neutral, you can turn that up or down. I turn this all the way down for maximum smoothness. Um, some people like to turn that up, especially in spec racing, to get you more, more initial throttle response. So that's kind of what that is. It's how hard it wants to start the motor. Uh, the coast is like a run-on for the speed control. If you run in real slick conditions and you need the motor to coast a little harder or whether you want no a deceleration brake coast, you can turn that up a little bit at a time. Um, drive PWM frequency or PWM drive frequency. This is the duty cycle the motor operates on. Higher is smoother, and there's actually a customizable chart. So if you want to get in between settings, you can go to this customize section and uh, dial that all in that way. I just run a nice linear uh, high frequency on mine. I like to be real smooth. It seems to come on nicely. 
A softening value and softening range. This is like power control or a current limiter. It makes it so that the speed control does not apply full power to the motor in a given range and you can control how much. So the throttle range or the softening range is how far into the throttle it does this before it turns off. And then the softening value is how much power it takes away. So you can use that when you have too much power for your own good or to make the car a little easier to drive, I think is the way. I don't mess with that too much for what we're doing. We really like to blitz the tires on command and we're running loose track. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good time. Uh, we get down here into brake control and up first is drag brake force this is the overall strength of your drag brake so when you let off to neutral it'll apply brakes this is not brakes for drag racing and if you are a drag racer you definitely do not want to use drag brakes it can be very hard on your speed control coming from those high rpms um, but for a lot of racing track applications drag brake allows the car to kind of auto decel when you let off the throttle which can be very helpful I don't run any of that in our 4x4 short courses, so I'm not going to turn that on here. Drag brake rate is how quickly the speed control applies the brake. So when you get to neutral, it can slap them on really fast or it can apply them a little more gently, and that allows you to tune that. Um, max brake force is your total braking strength of the speed control when you push the brakes on your radio. So if you want to turn the overall brake strength down so that you don't do endos or s smash your drivetrain. You can do that here. So you can still turn it down on your radio to soften it, but you only have a max amount that you can go up to. So for me, we never need 100% brake. So to keep things tame, I turn it down to like 90 ju just to make sure. And then I can turn it down a little. Oh, I didn't hit the button. I turn it down to 90 just to make sure that I don't, I don't go over rate. And brake rate control is much like the throttle rate, same thing, it slows the brakes down and all the way up, number 20 is gonna be the most linear and I like it there. And same thing with my brake frequency, I do with my drive frequency, I run that all the way up because it, it's a lot, I like it a lot smoother like that. And the high frequency efficiency, it just seems cool to me. It, this one also has some tuning where you have linear or traditional or hybrid. I haven't really messed with this enough to be able to explain it in depth on how it works. So I just leave it at traditional because that seems to work for most people all the time. Now, the danger zone, the timing area of the speed control. Boost timing is the timing advance that speed control can give the motor through a given RPM range. Turbo timing can do timing advance after full throttle. And dynamic timing advance from a speed control is the speed control taking the sensor information from the motor and then firing early. So it's like adding RPM to the motor magically from the speed control is the way it's kind of been explained over the years. I don't mess with boost or turbo on any of the stuff that we do because we usually run a plenty uh, fast enough motor. If you're in a situation where the motor's not quite quick enough, you're running out of pinion gears, you can mess with a lot of this stuff and get a little bit more out of your motor. If you watch a lot of the pro setup sheets, a lot of these guys run a little turbo or boost just to make the speed that they need from a slower motor or they like the feel of the motor so they don't want to gear up or whatever and they use all of this to, to make the motor quicker where it needs to be. So your boost timing is the amount of timing that you're going to put in there. Your activation can be set um, RPM or auto. So the speed control can actually decide what RPM it's going to kick in for you based off how quickly it ramps up. But you get a start RPM and an end RPM, and this sets where the timing kicks in. So your start RPM, it starts to apply that timing, and then it's going to finish applying all of it by the time you get to that RPM. And that's how the boost works, this upper section. Turbo timing, again, you have a turbo amount, and then you have some other settings to adjust how that comes in. Your delay is how long after full throttle before it kicks in. So you'll be at full throttle, it'll be two tenths of a second. And then you have an increase rate as well as a decrease rate. So the increase rate applies how quickly, or it affects how quickly it applies your timing. So let's say you had 30 degrees of timing, you get 12 of that every, or can't, you get 12 degrees every tenth of a second. So you'd have 24 degrees in the first two tenths and then all of it in the next three tenths after that. So you'd have a total of a half a second before all the time it was in there from the time you got to full throttle to the time it started to add in. Makes sense? So you can you can control how fast it feeds in the turbo, I mean, fast or slow. Slower, safer, fast is gonna be more aggressive. And then turbo decrease rate is gonna be how quickly it takes the, the timing back out. And that's for if you're modulating the throttle through a sweeper or a, a you know, a section of the track, if it takes the timing away too fast, the motor's going to slow down too much. So you want to balance that out or sometimes use that to your advantage that you have some uh, kind of like decel brake. So you, it gets you a lot of tuning options for what the turbo is going to do. And again, 
The boost timing and the turbo timing are going to give you a total electronic timing that adds on to the motor's end bell or mechanical timing. And all of that adds up to add not just RPM, but temperature. So all of this timing, whether it be electronic or mechanical that's in the end bell, adds together to give you your total timing that if it gets above... I like to say 40 to 45, and it gets real dangerous, kind of risky area, and people running well above that. So keep that in mind when you're doing all this stuff that you're, the more turbo and more timing you mess with, the kind of more danger zone you get into. And then we get down to the data, data record, data record, and it shows you the stuff that the speed control say, can save on the fly in its own brain. Uh, ESC temperature, motor temperature, minimum voltage, and the max recorded RPM. And this will change, if you run four pole motors, you get double the RPM that you're supposed to because it's a two pole speed control. Um, the other thing that a lot of folks, and I, I didn't know, that if you run your truck or your vehicle with the OTA installed, it does data recording also, and you get the cool graphs and charts that show you the whole run. I'm not a big fan of having an extra a device installed in my car, but for the sake of doing data logging, that can be pretty cool. Uh, so that is all the settings. And if you make all those setting changes and you don't hit save, nothing will happen. So make sure that once you do all that, you hit save so that it can make sure that it puts it all into the speed control. And then once you get out of there, you can back up and disconnect and you are good to go. Now, another one that I like to mention while I have an opportunity to chat your ear off about an OTA is something that gets overlooked a little bit, the OTA update. There's a firmware in this piece of hardware. It's not the database of the app. It's not the firmware, the speed control, and it is the in the settings. You go settings, then you go setting of the Bluetooth module, and then in here, you can change the name of your OTA, you can change your password, and you can check for firmware updates. So you want to go in there. Make sure that there's not a higher number than what you got. That's your number. This is going to be higher. This, since they match, I know I don't have an update. But that's the place to check. Um, if you ever have emailed us for any sort of issues, if your data log situation is not working, or if the speed control doesn't want to connect, it gives you a modulation error, that's usually where you're going to go to fix that. All right, so after that, power it down, unplug my OTA, Put my little rubber doohickey back in because it helps keep the dirt out of the speed control. And since I had the fan plugged on, unplugged that whole time, don't forget to plug my fan back in. The fans on these speed controls run all of the time. The speed control is turned on and powered up, or powered up and turned on rather. The, the fan will be running on the XE Run series. Uh, Max g2s do not run their fans they have a temperature sensor but there you have it folks i <laughs> they're never as quick as i think they're going to be because these settings and stuff make a lot of sense in my head but once i start talking about it it gets a little long-winded so thank you for staying tuned and listening to all that nonsense i hope it helped if it didn't you please send us an email north america at hobbywing.com we are always happy to help out our friendly rc nerd friends we do a podcast twice a month we give away a free hobbywing combo each and every episode all you have to do to enter to win is listen to a podcast look us up on your favorite podcast service we're called rc stuff powered by hobby Wayne. thanks for joining me once again on the nerd bench for a fresh episode of the charlie show right here on the hobby wing official youtube channel thanks for watching everybody we will see you next time